Greetings of peace. Recent events in Sri Lanka have been a cause for both hope and anxiety, but mostly confusion. Why has Sri Lanka apparently fallen apart? Certainly, the government has fallen apart. What is the history of conflict in Sri Lanka and how does it relate to the food and fuel shortages that seem to have sparked the current crisis? In this conversation, Hemantha Vithanage, a Sri Lankan who works on environmental justice issues, is joined by our own Samir Dosani to go into some of the details of the current situation. As always, do remember to like, subscribe and share this interview with your friends. With that, please enjoy this discussion. Hemantha Vithanage, it's a real pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. So before we begin, if you could just tell us a little bit about uh, your own background, what's your current position, what is your area of work right now? Currently, I'm the chairperson of the Friends of the Earth International, and um, I'm also the senior advisor to the Center for Environmental Justice, which I found in 2004, um, So, which is an environmental justice organization based in Sri Lanka, mostly engaged in environmental litigation, but we do a lot of uh, monitoring on the um, international financial institutions and and many other work related to science and, and other um, community work. Yeah, and of course, uh, we know each other since about 2002, when I became the, the director of the uh, NGO Forum on the ADB, and then you became the director after I, I left as well. Uh, so yes, I, I joined uh, as the executive director in 2005, and I was there until 2008. Yeah, so, so we have a long and, and shared history. But listen, I'm, yeah, I'm still part of the. Yeah, I'm still part of the uh, executive committee of the India Forum on ADB. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit about the history of Sri Lanka. So, so from what I understand, um, prior to the colonial period, meaning prior to the British coming, there were there were two kingdoms in what is today Sri Lanka. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct actually, um, because uh, the uh, the Sinhalese people ruled. Uh, most part of Sri Lanka, uh, but at some point uh, there were some uh, Tamilians uh, like King Alara. Um, they came to Sri Lanka and captured uh, almost uh, half of Sri Lanka. Um, and also uh, the kingdom in Yafna was more than uh, 900 years old. Um, so at, at some points there were some um, uh, Tamilians who were ruling um, the Jaffna, which is the north, uh, north, north, northern part of Sri Lanka, um, and also the, the Sinhalese kings. And lately, our last last uh, king is actually Nayakar uh, Grace, and he has also come from uh, India. Um, so um, most of the time um, in, in the recent history, before the, below, before the colonialization, uh, colonization, it was like two kingdoms. Yeah. And if I understand correctly, when the British came, they sided with the, the Tamil uh, side. Is that is that more or less correct or have I got it wrong? Uh, no, actually, before British come, um, the Pandavas from India, so they were ruling uh, most of the, uh, the trade um, uh, lines. Um, but uh, then the uh, Portuguese people came in 1505. Um, and uh, so uh, they ruled only the coastal line of Sri Lanka and they controlled uh, the trading uh, part. Then to get rid of uh, Portuguese, uh, Sri Lankan kings had some connection with the uh, Dutch people and uh, Dutch came to Sri Lanka around 1796, I think. So they ruled almost like 100 years. Then um, starting um, 1800, uh, uh, English, British people also came. So um, before we got independence in 1948, we had three uh, European nations colonizing the country. Uh, but I, I think uh, Portuguese and the Dutch, so they also um, had uh, uh, introduced some governance systems to the country. Um, at the same time, so they were more interested on the spices uh, trade, uh, gems, um, elephant tusk, things like that. But when the British came, British uh, initially introduced coffee plantations, 
and then uh, when the coffee um, was collapsed coffee plantations were collapsed so they have introduced tea plantations um, and until now Ceylon tea uh, Australian country is a very famous one um, they also built railway tracks to bring all these uh, production to the Colombo city so they started roads and um, railway systems and also um, the various uh, governance mechanisms um, to Sri Lanka until we got the, the freedom uh, in 1948, independence in 1948. But in 1972, Sri Lanka became a, a kind of Jana Raja. Uh, it's, it's completely uh, to, uh, to go away from the under the British crown. So in, in 1972, actually, we got the uh, full independence. Uh, and until then, uh, there was a representative from British uh, ruling family um, as the governor uh, to rule through Sri Lanka. But since 1972, um, we have a, uh, actually 1977 constitution brought the executive presidency. Yeah. Which was the first executive president was actually uh, Jaya Jayawardena. Sure. So I, I just want to understand before we go further, uh, this split between the uh, Tamil-speaking people and Sinhalese-speaking people, is it primarily a linguistic split, or is there also a, a religious element to the split? What What does it mean exactly? Um, I I don't think it's a it's a religious split, but it was about the language. Uh, because one of the allegations was that uh, in, in Tamil uh, area, so there's, uh, there's more Tamil speaking people, but it's still the uh, most of the, uh, the government um, uh, administration has done in, in, in Sinhala language and also English language. Uh, but it was again um, about the land, uh, the, the ownership to the land. Uh, so and also the sharing the resources. So uh, because uh, Jaffna, especially in that area, uh, they have very little resources. There's no water. There there are no rivers running, and the topsoil is very very little. Uh, most of the areas are forested areas, um, and also uh, especially Jaffna is is very much. Uh, um, limestone, uh, so therefore they have the water scarcity, so this kind of resources, and there were no jobs in that area. So most of the uh, the Tamil-speaking people from that part they used to come to Colombo uh, for work, um, and um, so that was the um, the resource scarcity is is one of the issue in that area, but also the language governance mechanism, who are actually ruling the country, is also and and the. The, the role they play in the politics is also involved in, in this split. Yeah. So, so uh, and what is the percentage? Is it like 50-50, like 50 Tamil, 50 Sinhalese, or is it... Is it uh... No, actually 70%, uh, almost 69% uh, Sinhalese. Okay. Um, and I think uh, about 7% Muslims and rest are um, Tamil. Yeah. And if I understand the geography correctly, most of the Muslims happen to also be um, Tamil speaking. Is that correct? Um, yeah, that's also true because uh, the, some of the ancestors from uh, for for the Muslims have come from Arabic countries, but when they when they come here, so they got married to uh, to Tamil Tamil people, Tamil speaking women, um, and also some single speaking women as well. Uh, because the the story is actually so when the Muslim uh, people came to Sri Lanka, so they were. Uh, they didn't bring the women with them, so they have married to the to the Sri Lankan women. So therefore, um, uh, I think most of the people started speaking Tamilian language, but there's there are Arabic speaking Muslims also in Sri Lanka. Sure, 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 sure. Okay, so this is the context. So, so I, what I I still haven't understand in in terms of the colonial context, because the way that um, colonization tends to work is that they, they favor one group over the other, especially the British, this whole divide and rule thing. Did that happen in the case of Sri Lanka as well? Um, I think yes, yes and no, uh, because in the independence struggle, actually, um, um, if you if you look at who got involved other than the Sinhalese people, uh, people like Ponambulam uh, Ramanathan, and, and there are a lot of Tamilian people also in the forefront of the uh, independence struggle against the British. 
Uh, but I think, um, as as usual, these colon, colonizers so they have used um, the ethnic uh, differences, religious differences, as well as the race, um, the caste differences, all of them, for for to make make the uh, ruling easier. So I think that also has some um, uh, situations, some 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 background to 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 divide the the nation. Uh, but I think this this division is also uh, um, also there because in, in 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 at one point for the tea plantations the British um, uh, brought uh, uh, people from Tamil speaking people from India so they are the majority in the in the central hills in the tea plantation area so actually uh, uh, I mean the, in, in 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 speaking in that way. So we have Tamilians who have been in the country for almost like one thousand years, mostly in the in the in the northern part, but also in the central hilly areas. So we have the Tamilians who were brought uh, after the British came to Sri Lanka, um, and also um, there are there are differences. Some some of the Tamilians, uh, for example, the uh, the, the Tamil people living in Mana area, so they are um, Catholic, uh, but uh, majority are Hindu Hindu Tamil speaking people. Um, but I think in the in the in the central part, it's mostly uh, the Hindus um, Hindus as well as the the, um, the Catholic uh, also there. Yeah. And there, there it's, are, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a seriously complex situation in Sri Lanka. For sure. Um, but are there yeah. also Buddhist uh, Tamilian people? Or, or Yes. Yes, there are. There are some. Okay. Okay. So this is all very interesting. So, so you and I are old enough to remember sort of the early days of uh, the LTTE. So mm -hmm. maybe you can explain a little bit about that history and, and what led to an actual like a long and protracted civil war in, in your country. Okay. Um, I think until seventy two, Sri Lanka was still under the under the British um, crown. Um, but in nineteen seventy two, uh, so the government had had a different constitution. Um, but in nineteen seventy seven, constitution actually um, gave this thirteen amendment. Um, and and uh, and various kind of governance mechanisms, but but that government introduced the open economy to the country. The 1972 government was more thinking about a sovereign nation, and they have stopped importing from India and many other countries. And they want to have the food sovereignty. They want to have the sustainability with the country. And they started um, convincing people um, to grow more, plant more, um, and produce more. Um, but this um, had a lot of troublesome years for the uh, people, uh, almost like three years. Uh, so we had uh, food scarcity, and they allowed only to transport two kilograms of rice, one kilogram of chili, um, and there were a lot of difficulties for the people. But but to, to get the power, um, 1977 government actually um, initiated open economy and this open economy actually opened a floodgate. So all kind of imports came to Sri Lanka from various parts of the world, which actually had something to do with the, the people who have uh, brought things from India uh, and sold it in Sri Lanka and some, some of the products so they, they produce in Sri Lanka, so they sold it to India. So that's sort of a trade relationship also there. But when this kind of issues together with the, uh, with the political issues and also the language issues, that actually created some problems for, uh, for the Tamil speaking people. So then uh, the first people, uh, they have Actually, in 1976, Alper Doriapa, um, who was the mayor of uh, Jaffna World Skilled. Uh, but in 1983, so there was a um, killing of 13 Sri Lankan soldiers uh, by, the, by the groups. Um, and that time, actually, there were LTT, Eros, and, and, and various other, other groupings. Uh, but um, so they took the responsibility for killing, but but that's this created 
uh, uh, riots in across the country and um, and uh, uh, the mostly the polit- politically ba- supported uh, groups they started uh, uh, the killing and burning um, and and this this is called black july uh, so and and during this time uh, so the actually that could be the 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 beginning of this this ltt um, uh, war um, Sinhalese um, and and war between the Sinhalese and the, and the Tamilian people. Um, it is um, actually it it was a bloodshed across the country, and and this war um, went up to a situation that um, the many countries started supporting each side. And but in uh, starting two thousand five, uh, there was a um, the, the the government started arranging for the final fight um, i think in 2005 they started cleaning up in the um the the um, the fighting fighting hard in the eastern province but this went um, continuously until 2009 um, until the the uh, the war ended by with a with a huge um human uh, sufferings yeah. Um, so, so we need to. Yeah. So, so we just need to remember, I guess, that this isn't a war that ended through negotiated. Maybe there were some negotiations at the end of it, but basically, the the army, the Sinhalese-backed uh, army, defeated the the so-called Tamil Tigers, the LTTE, uh, completely. Yes. 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 But but there was a time in two thousand one uh, when when the newly elected government it was, it was a short term government, like two year government. It was um, under the Chandrika's presidency, but the uh, the Prime Minister was Ranil Vikramasinghe, and and there was a time there was some negotiations started, uh, but I think that time um, there were some incidents happened. Some of those uh, um, the the informants were killed, and there were a lot of lot of um, things happened during that time. Um, so that we lost that moment, and 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 the the one of the minister from. Uh, Norway also um, got involved as a peace negotiator, and there were many other. The people tried to do the peace negotiation. At, at one point in the 1980s, uh, the Indian peace peak, KP force also came to Sri Lanka in 1986, 87, I believe. After the um, of Rajiv Gandhi. So, so, for Indian listeners, yes. uh, remember that uh, the LTTE was also implicated in the assassination of Rajiv Gandhi. Exactly, yeah, and and also when when Rajiv Gandhi visited Sri Lanka that time, uh, just before the IPKF came to Sri Lanka, and there was a um, there was an incident by one of the um, the soldier attacked Rajiv Gandhi. Um, I hope everyone remember that incident. But only after that, this killing happened. Um, so it was a it was a. a Terrible time for Sri Lanka, but in, in at the same time in 1988, um, the the youth from the uh, from the southern part of the country also initiated uh, a revolution. Uh, compared to com- o- almost the same group uh, started the revolution in 1971, um, which I forgot to tell initially. So it was a youth uprising in 1971. And then it was. Uh, it was controlled with the support of India. Uh, I think um, some figures is about 20,000 uh, youth were killed in that time. But the same group um, actually uh, ran for the presidency um, in 1982. Uh, but uh, so they were not allowed to do that. Um, and actually they lost in 1988. They came back. Um, and that killed more than hundred thousand. Uh, I mean, the in number of figures, but I mean, maybe more more people were killed in in, in that time. Uh, but that was a very bad time for both north and south uh, part of the country. Uh, and uh, and after that, uh, the leader of that party, Rohan Vijayvara, was also killed. Um, and, and it was a it was a heavy armed. Uh, um, control um, uh, even in the in the southern part of the country, uh, but um, compared to what has happened um, in the in the in the northern part, um, I think uh, it is 
also significant. Uh, but I would say, in 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 both both side, and there were there were fights in in both North and East at in 1988 89 period. Yeah. So just to understand exactly what's going on here, so so we have the the ethnic conflict that has um, its origins in in the fact that you know Sri Lanka is one country and not two, when historically it may have been two and so on. Um, and that the Sinhalese are, are a majority and therefore the power, the political parties, if you want to come to power, you have to be sort of, you're more likely to be Sinhalese than to be Tamil, at least at the federal level. In the local levels, of course, it will be different. Um, yeah. So that's one area of tension. And then when you have these student uprisings and so on, these are largely leftists. These are largely, is it trade unions organizing? Who, who is coming up with those student movements? What, what political forces? These were actually the left um, youth movement. Yes. Mostly they, um, they organized at the university levels. Yeah. Uh, but uh, even in 1971, it, it was um, at, the, at the university level. Uh, but in 1980, it also it was at the you know, youth, youth, it was the youth movement. Um, but um, we have the traditional uh, left parties, which are not this kind of um, armed people. Uh, but that uh, left is all, almost um, uh, almost faded out now. Uh, but still, the um, the youth movement, which was built in 1971 and and, and again in 1988, now they have come as uh, the JVP Janatavi Mukti Peramuna. So they are they have three uh, seats in the parliament at the moment. Uh, but uh, there are there were some splits time to time, and some of them are now in a in a very um, right wing um, political parties as well. Uh, but but the left party also now, um, other than the JVP Jantavi Muthi Purma, there's a there's a frontline socialist party which is called Paratugami in the local language. So they are both of them are very visible at the moment in the Sri Lankan politics. Yeah, I can imagine. So, so let us um, fast forward a little bit. So in the post, um, so once things sort of calm down with the Civil War, you have this party that comes to power that's, that's been, that, the one that's basically has just been ousted now. And if I understand correctly, they were sort of a, a Sinhalese nationalist kind of party. Is that correct? Um, actually, the, 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 the party which took in around 2005, which is uh, Sri Lanka Freedom Party. Uh, so they collapsed after some time. So they created a new party called uh, uh, Podujana Peramuna. Um, so in this Podujana Peramuna, actually the former LTT people, um, Kader people also um, are there, people like Pillayan is there, um, and uh, Karuna Amman is part of that. So, um, so uh, that's the party actually uh, right now ruling uh, ruling uh, party um, and and uh, in 2005 actually it is Mahinda Rajapaksa who uh, who was the pres uh, president at that time uh, started fighting against the LTT um, I, I believe this was also resulted of the various bombing including the bombing of the um, the uh, the army commander that time uh, Sarat Ponseka so this resulted um, fighting um, continuously until 2009. Uh, but but it was the same Sri Lankan Freedom Party um, is, is, is the one ruling um, at that time. So tell me a little bit about the politics of the, the people who are, are being ousted now. So, so are they center, left, right, not, none of that? How, how would you describe them? The, um, if, you, if you call this is a... Uh, political visionary, I think they are, they are like the social democrats, um, but they have they are very much um, the capitalist um, uh, regime, um, and also um, the uh, much more than the uh, the political ideology. I think so. They uh, were they were accused for um, having a lot of corruption because soon after the. Um, the uh, the war um, somehow ended, so uh, it was a time for a lot of development, and that was the same time that country got the middle income um, state, um, and that was a time that um, other than the concessional loans, so the Sri Lanka had the access to get this uh, 
private uh, uh, capital ventures and all kind of bondholders. So they started receiving uh, almost um, more than fifty percent of the of the um, the uh, funds came from various um, private bondholders. Um, the ideally before that most of the the infrastructure construction because that was a time that there were a highway system started and and the harbor um, uh, building and a lot of infrastructure um, was initiated including uh, hambantota harbor in um, colombo port city um, and this kind of um, uh, money came from these kind of various sources um, and um, i think this rapid development allowed more and more corruption so i think that's that's why um, now people accuse them for taking out uh, looting some 19 billion us dollars from the sri lankan economy um, and and investing in other countries um, but but basically uh, uh, 2000 uh, in, in in 2014 actually that party was defeated um, at, at and mahindra rajapaksa lost the presidential election and then uh, Maitripala Sirisen who was one of the person from the same political party he he he, he left the party and he became the common candidate um, and um, his party uh, half of his party um, but together with the UNP United National Party um, so they merged and uh, together with the um, the uh, JVP and and few other small parties, so they created a coalition government in 2015, and to, uh, it was called Yahapalani, which is um, the the local uh, local language. It's called uh, uh, Good Governance. I mean, in, in in English, Good Governance Party, but but it's called Yahapalani in, in local language. So they had the ruling until 2019 until President Gotabi Rajapaksa was elected in, in November 2020. Sorry, November 2019. So during the COVID period, the, the same party has been back in power, basically? Um, the same party was, yes. Because in, in 2019, November, Gotabi Rajapaksa was elected. In, in 2020, August, uh, the uh, Pudujana Peramona became um, the ruling party. Uh, so in around uh, August yeah. in 2020. So we're describing these so, folks as... Um, so I, I think just to give a bit of context. So the last time I was in Sri Lanka was almost 20 years ago, 2003, 2004, something like that. Mm -hmm. And the feeling that we got was that um, this was just, you know, you and me and, and some other friends talking maybe. Uh, the idea was the war may be coming to an end. That was the feeling we had then. Um, the war may be coming to an end. And when the war comes to an end, this paradise is going to be lost <laughs> in the sense that there was all so much green. There was so much still natural forest. Um, there was so much fishing and so on, small fisher, fisher people, fishing villages and so on that one could see in Sri Lanka. And what we anticipated and what you're telling me has happened since that time, almost 20 years ago, is that um, the war ended. People saw uh, international investors saw a time of potential prosperity and development. They all went in with a lot of money. Chinese investors get a lot of attention, but it's not just the Chinese. I think it's lots of people, China, India, Europe, like mm -hmm. everywhere. Yeah. And the result is that all the governments that are coming after that, or e maybe even at that time, these are massive contracts to do massive development works. And, you know, like many countries, there is a cut. The government will get a little, or the individuals will get a little kickback. Yeah. Is that yeah. is that really is that the, what the picture that I painted is it correct? Yeah, actually, um, start in two thousand five, um, very first coal power plant came. Uh, it was with the support of the uh, the Chinese uh, government. It was a loan from China, but it's a used coal power plant in China for more than thirty years. Um, so um, since then, the road uh, in, uh, road uh, network and the um, the um, Lotus Tower and 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 Hambantota Harbour, all these constructions came, um, and there were a lot of investors. Actually, on 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 this on top of this kind of development um, uh, development um, oriented paradigm shift, 
because country thought they they want to go for the same uh, line with Japan, Korea, and China, and all of them. But then at the same time, starting two thousand eight, Sri Lanka became a hotspot because the the China Belt Road Initiative wanted to have the financial hub in Sri Lanka, and they started negotiating with the government and started filling. A land mass next to Colombo Harbour, which is now called Colombo Port City, and they have a plan to build until two thousand forty-five, and and to bring all kind of businesses, business centers, actually business head offices to to Colombo Port City and start building um sixty seventy story buildings. Um, it's a, it's a massive development. They are talking, uh, but but this kind of painting of the of the the sri lankan picture abroad becomes sri lanka a hot spot and then um, the geopolitically india united states australia everybody got uh, interested on on the country and especially because uh, sri lanka is a very strategic point because of the uh, the, the two third of the um, the the um, the ships are going very next to Sri Lanka, so it's a strategically it's a it's a very important trade um, hub, and also if you want to touch the Indian market, Sri Lankan harbors are quite important. So this is why I think they started building Hambantota Harbour. But unfortunately, um, we had a lot of um, fight on the, from the environmental environmental side. We were we were failed to do that. But the idea of building Hambantota Harbour is that. Uh, initiating kind of a, a kind of a service port, um, but uh, when when Sri Lanka was not able to pay the debt, so they completely leased this um, uh, this with the the China Chinese company, um, and uh, now it is under a Chinese control for next ninety nine years, um, and also they started getting the Colombo port city, which is in the Colombo harbour. So this created interest for the uh, for the um, Americans as well as the Indians to get the uh, eastern side, which is the Trincomalee Harbour. So I think so when when we talk about the Sri Lankan development context, we cannot forget all this geopolitics as well as the intervention of the Chinese regime, U.S. regime, and the Indians. Um, I hope there there will be many some others as well. No, it's fascinating. It's very fascinating. So just just walk us through the last few weeks or months. So what has happened in terms of what what we see is people have you know taken over the president's house and this kind of stuff, and and we see that those people have fleed and the government is in shambles. This all we can see uh, on the news. But how did it start? What 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 happened that this is now happening? Actually, uh, so when this regime was elected in two thousand nineteen. I'm um, the way the president was elected in 2019 November. Uh, within two weeks, the president declared that okay, no uh, transport license is required for sand mining, sand transport. So that's the time environmental movement started fighting against this government. And then lately, they did deregulated more than 500,000 hectares of the forest area, which is called other state forest. Then again, we. We had a court case, and and we had a fight on the streets. We had demonstrations, but um, my organization alone, Center for Environmental Justice, have filed more than twenty six court cases by now in the last thirty two months against this regime because we saw a lot of environmental destruction happening, but people didn't wake up. We have asked for people to wake up, but people didn't wake up. On twenty uh, September twenty twenty. Um, according to the IMF, we have passed the debt sustainability level. Our our GDP, our our low national income was surpassed by the debt payment one hundred one percent. So that was the time the government decided that no vehicle trans vehicle importation, no farm oil importation, and some other essential essential things they have stopped importing. But then. Few months later, so they say we are not going to import chemical fertilizer, and that created a lot of problems because we didn't have the organic fertilizer, and government wanted to completely convert the chemical fertilizer cultivation to the uh, to the organic fertil organic cultivation. This created a lot of problem. People came to the streets, and people didn't cultivate, and and this created 
um, a pathway to the to the food food uh, less food production, which is actually right now we 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 are suffering because um, we had to import rice from India uh, and and many others from India under the Indian uh, credit line as well. Um, so then after that. Um, about six months ago, government said, okay, they don't have dollars to purchase um, uh, fuel. Um, and that created queues alone, all the petrol stations, and there was no um, money to import uh, coal and the LNG. Um, and, and at the beginning, they started with about 12 hour power cuts. But uh, fortunately, rain came uh, because it's still uh, rain, um, the hydropower is, 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 a, is a big, playing a big role. Um, so it has reduced to about three hours, four hours. Even today, right now, there's no electricity in, in, in my area. Um, so that kind of uh, problem. Then at some point, so they changed uh, about, about eight or nine months ago. They changed the formula of the LPG gas to propane butane uh, uh, mixture. Uh, so which started around 730 incidents of explosions of the of the gas uh, gas cookers and this all related now when the when the um, the roads uh, I mean the, when the petrol station started having these queues and then that was a point about 100 days ago uh, exactly 101 days ago i think uh, on on april 9 uh, some groups um, started fighting um, and and so they went a, in front of president's house. It, it was organized by one of the politicians. But lately, um, some other people, agitated people, also went there. And there was a there was a tear gas spraying and burning of a bus, and that created the momentum. Momentum, and then people came to the goal face, and they they have uh, um, uh, started protesting in the goal face which was supported by many, many people, many, peop many people come from various places. And there was a mini fight. Um, and, and this main, main uh, place in, in front of the presidential secretariat called Gota Go village or Gota Go Gama. Uh, but then um, there was another similar, similar um, action uh, protest started in front of the president's uh, uh, res uh, prime minister's resident, which is called No Deal Village or No Deal Gama. Um, and, and this um, re resulted actually on the May 9th, um, the president, um, sorry, prime minister uh, say he, he will resign. But before he resigned, um, there was a, there was a, a, a small um, event in, in, in president's uh, prime minister's house in Aralia Gahamandiriya. And in that moment, some of the politicians agitated the local people. Local people walked to the golf face green and attacked um, the, um, the protesters, and which created anger among many other people. They came and they started uh, beating them and, and throwing them to the Bere Lake, one of the polluted lakes um, in, in located in, in Colombo City, next to the presidential secretariat. Um, and they started burning houses, um, and and anyway, um, soon after, um, Prime Minister uh, resigned. Uh, one month later, his other brother Basil Rajapaksa also resigned from the Finance Minister position. Uh, so on the June 9th, uh, the people started demanding that uh, President must go now. Um, and I think uh, it, it, I mean, it continuously happened on the July 9th. So the people came uh, back to Colombo and uh, started protesting. And, and then they go and occupied presidential house and presidential secretariat, prime minister's uh, residence. Um, and also they went to, uh, uh, to other uh, some television stations, etc. also they, they have occupied. Yeah. So, who are the people who are protesting? Are they are they mixed? Is it mostly Sinhalese, mostly Tamil? I see a lot of students. I I would say um, it's mostly the youth, youth. But uh, it was originally it was like we call it Nirpakshika, and there was no political part for many of them. But uh, then later we have realized that okay, um, the uh, the uh, frontline socialists party people and the youth again 
and the and the jvp janata vimukti peramona and many other non aligned people also in this protest um i i think at the beginning everyone was coming as like a non aligned uh, people but but now we realize that there are some um differences between these different groups and there was some uh, some um, uh, splits as well uh, but it was mostly the young people initiated but uh, but then the artist and environmentalist and and many other civil society people also joined within the first few few days uh, and first few weeks um and 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 supported by uh, business people and uh, supported by hotels in the area and and the big companies also supported um, so the, the impetus it, really it is that, that there was no fuel right so so my question about the fuel just just to go back a little bit is I mean was there yeah. a crash on the currency first why did they have to buy the fuel I mean everyone buys pe- fuel in everyone buys petrol in dollars but if you have a, a local yeah. bank and let's say it's 100 rupees to the dollar or whatever it is you can make more rupees and you can buy more fuel right they weren't going to do that because of the finance ministry policies or no actually actually the problem in sri lanka is actually there's no dollars because our foreign reserves has almost emptied so there's no dollars to buy so the bank started buying even because because some of the people don't send the money through the government bank system so they use um other illegal mechanisms called undial and hawala and all kind of different systems so therefore um the one of the thing the how the dollar dollar came to sri lanka before was that it was through the tourism but because of the the covid tourism um collapse um and and there were some initiatives to to mobilize the ukrainian tourist and the russian tourist uh, but they also stopped after after um, the ukraine war started uh, so then the other was like the all the migratory workers in the middle east so they they used to send dollars Uh, but also they had some difficulties because of the the covid so and simply there was no adequate dollars but the government expenditure was more and more so then the government started printing at actually uh, from starting 2020 by now so they have printed more than 2.3 trillion sri lankan rupees uh, which has e- increase the inflation in the country um so but it's still uh, although you have the rupees and the people people have the money in hand but there are no products in the in the in the market you know no goods in the market and um, similarly there's no dollars and initially so when they don't have the money so they have brought they have bought dollars from the private market um and it started paying to some of these um, the ships uh, but it's still um, there was no dollar coming to sri lanka because there's no reserve i think i think that's the main reason for for us not to have dollars to buy um the fossil fuel at the moment so although um the, according to the central bank governor new central bank governor so uh, he said that um, although people buy uh, petrol and diesel Um, the petroleum corporation doesn't have the dollars to purchase every time uh, the central bank has to look for the dollars to uh, to uh, to pay for these uh, shipments okay so i mean from a one perspective this is a very exciting time that in sri lanka because you have um for whatever reasons you have a mass based popular movement that is successful in demanding change you have been cut off from the globalization from the the global supply lines and so on not necessarily in a healthy way and not not in a planned way but um you know that that op- offers the opportunity to find alternative um sources of uh, alternative economies uh almost tomorrow right everyone has to survive and they're going to you have to help each other survive so maybe you know today you were a ban- yesterday you were a banker today you are selling eggs or something i mean i don't know what it, what does it look like is is there a feeling of hope of of something may change in a positive way there or is it mostly just desperation no you you are right actually i mean this is a very very good opportunity and although although we have all the criticism about previous president gorabe rajapaksa at least he tried to introduce the organic uh, cultivation and and also the f- thinking about the in in a in a way that it's about the food sovereignty and then promoting uh, renewable energy so it was about the uh, energy sovereignty in the country but our system was not 
enough and the people were not educated and the engineers and all these educated people also didn't play the right role uh, the ceylon electricity board opposed to i mean the developing all these renewable resources renewable electricity resources so that's one of the reason um, i mean the, I, if i want to blame I, i will not only blame the the president and the political system but even the govern 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 government um top level people also are uh, heavily responsible for corruption and and also uh, various kind of um, um i mean the problems so they have created but it's it's a it's a good opportunity if you if you think but the only problem right now we don't have that kind of alternative thinking coming in the country although there are small small initiatives but i am surprised to see that even the even the people who are protesting so they want to go for imf so the imf they think imf is the only solution because the imf can bring the kind of uh, debt restructuring and also if they give us some sort of a support so then so they we will we will get more loans more more grants from the other countries that's what how people are thinking about actually most of the money and some of the money we have got to the country has gone through the illegitimate debt because uh, some of the projects have not even started but still the money is missing and and some of the money which was we were supposed to bring to the country through the royalty and other things uh, so they have not come to the come to the national uh, treasury national uh, uh, monetary system so there are a lot of other problems also now um i'm i'm surprised to see that how come everyone is thinking about imf is the only solution i mean there are certain people talking about that pro- increasing production is the solution actually increasing food sovereignty is the solution increasing energy sovereignty is the is the is a solution but this is the still the minority uh, opinion i think at the parliamentary level Them because our parliament is not very educated people are uh, in the parliament uh, very few educated people but it's still they are more more like a party people and they 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 are supporting only the party policies and and not the actually um, more bring in those kind of um, uh, uh, i mean the educated solution uh, uh, solutions to the situation so therefore um, so we have very little hopes about Um, how the country is going to go out of this crisis um i i have seen that the countries like argentina zimbabwe so they are going through this same same problem and and i have learned that um imf solutions are taking more than 10 years even some some countries even after 10 years is still the same problem so it's it's not much there's no much hope yeah. um to the to the people in sri lanka at the moment because one of the problem is actually the political crisis is has become to the forefront because that is what actually the media is mostly dominating it's not about the debt crisis now debt crisis is his hidden under the political crisis um, and also there's no forum for um, discussing about the alternative approaches to the economic crisis um, i i think i think which, which is a shame um but at the same time people are started doing various kind of um own solutions and that means cutting forest and um planting um the, doing the cultivation um which is actually the last two and a half years this government has been promoting now it is even increasing me more and also there are other solutions like the uh, death for nature swap um is coming now i, I heard nature conservancy is going to buy buy back about 1 billion worth debt um and 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 the the, the national uh, treasury uh, central bank actually so they have they are positive on that but they want to have the control over some marine systems in sri lanka which is going to have uh, some rights violation for the fishermen yeah. um so things like that also coming um and 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 some people are thinking about selling biodiversity credit carbon credit um and 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 blue credits and this these sounds like there's a lot actually... of bad solutions but are there any good solutions exactly. is there any, any politician who is actually has a plan who's proposing something or any political force trade unions or something that that may be useful here um 
on for the economic crisis i i don't see any any solutions coming at the moment other other than uh, some of those people on the social media is talking about this because the the political parties are actually uh, much more um, i mean the hidden uh, into the political crisis because they are talking about the political crisis i don't know what is going to happen on the 20th because 20th they are going to have the parliament Uh, is going to gather they are going to vo- vote for the the future president and there are i think six or seven different names are coming including ranil vikram singh who is actually um, acting uh, president at the moment okay so we might have i mean there's a lot of focus on the political solutions we need a better focus on the economic side of things and on, on the practical side of things right politics doesn't necessarily change people's day-to-day lives. So if people want to be supportive of what's going on or you know people in Sri Lanka what can what can people outside Sri Lanka do? Um actually uh, um I saw various reports now save the children fund has done a done a, a small survey and they have found at least 1 million people are suffering from various problems related to the food scarcity and there are there is a increase of child marriages increase of uh, sex workers and and things like that so i think one of the one of the thing i am i want to get is that we want to have the reestablish this uh, the security safety network for the for the people and we want to make sure that people are not going in hunger and uh, not sleeping without without meal um, but unfortunately our our uh, current acting president um uh, even at some point say okay there's no other option so we people have to reduce their three meals to two meals so i think i think that's one of the area that international support can come and also people don't have the medicines at the moment so i think there there should be some sort of a um the support um, i can expect from the the civil society and the, and the movements abroad um but i think on the on the economic side this debt is a is a big issue now for this year we have to pay 7 billion us dollars debt service but we don't have even few hundred millions um, us dollar in 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 the in the foreign reserves for us so some of the some of the debt actually there's a illegitimate debt and some of the debt um some countries like the not not only some countries but also um the uh, the concessional loans we have received from world bank adb they they think about restructuring and and getting um delay payment um but um some of the countries um who can afford they should thinking about debt cancellation i think especially uh, i i i think we have we have few billions of rupees a few billions of dollars actually this can be called illegitimate debt and some of the some of the project has given a lot of money but but uh, e- even the none of the groundwork has done so these are illegitimate debt so i think the cancellation of debt is another another approach um i can expect uh, from the international community but at the same time the situation in sri lanka it can escalate at the moment people are fighting in in the petrol queues in in the, in the in the in the in the markets um, and and there are a lot of uh, theft um is increasing i think this can increase to the human right violations i think international community also should be very vigilant on the the human right violations uh, which uh, which is happening in sri lanka at the moment and also i think i i see that now yesterday um, the emergency law was um, gazetted so i think next few months we 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 will see that uh, how they are using the human the the emergency law to arrest these activists i think i think that sort of um things the human rights um, community also should be vigilant and also the 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 groupings like the european union and 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 japan and all all of them have to really think about how can how can we build the civil society space because if at the moment we see that just there's a protest and everybody think that okay we have the civil civil space to speak and and and, and share our our um, opinions etc but i think under the emergency law so we are going to have very shrinking 
um, uh, civil society, civil space. So I, I think that also should be vigilant. So, so yes. those are some of the areas that I think the international community can involve. But at the same time, some of the some of the groups uh, are interested about intervening um, with certain countries to bring these loot looted money back to the country. Um, I think uh, we still need to do uh, some research where this money is available, whether there are uh, any any kind of money which can be freeze, freeze in, in, in certain other countries. But I think you need um, some um, more research work to do before um, we engage in that sort of work. Fantastic. So just to sum up, I, I think the most important things um, from what you just said. So one is if people want to help, they can look at um, some kind of reputable humanitarian agency that may be providing meals and so on. Uh, the second is if people want to advocate uh, together with uh, Sri Lankan organizations that are leading the charge on this, on the cancellation of illegitimate debt, uh, that may be a second thing that people can do. Um, and then um, a third, sorry, there was a third. Oh, um, I think there's something, oh, the third is about human rights law and to make sure that, um, that whoever's in charge, whoever ends up being in charge after this, respects human li rights law and that we don't see human rights violations uh, going off the chart and that there is space for uh, civil society organizations who who play, have a role to play in terms of watchdogs and current, in terms of organized uh, dissent even, that they be allowed to play a role. Yeah? Yes, yes. And anything yeah. you'd like to add to the conversation, Hamanta? I, th I think one of the things is now we need to have a sort of a public um, debt audit um, so without without doing that, I, I I don't think it's easy for us to to prove that what is illegitimate and what is what is not illegitimate. I, I think I think the, the expert community, in, I mean, the, who are who are working uh, with the civil society, can also play a, a, a good role, um, um, bring in that sort of things. And also, we all have a lobby with the World Bank, ADB. I think I think these kind of banks uh, have have been um, um, initiated to support the countries with this kind of situations because um, the um, I, I think these multilateral banks still can play a role. I'm not I'm not uh, saying that okay because these are the neoliberal agencies and 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 they are the they are going to be the solu solution for us. But at this moment, I think the Sri Lankan it's not only Sri Lanka. But I think uh, I, I have had a webinar recently and I realized that um, Sri Lanka, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, in, in, in South Asia region, we all going through the same kind of debt issue at the moment. So I think so we uh, jointly we should think about yeah. how these um, is definitely you cannot get a mercy from the private bondholders you know the the bondholders like uh, blackrock and all of them and we can see how badly they have behaved in 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 zimbabwe and argentina and right already there is there's one court case already filed in the united states against against sri lanka um, by by one of the bondholders so i think these kind of things we can see coming in the future but but the multilateral banks can can uh, do a better job in in uh, without putting people into the debt crisis. Yeah, and, if I can play devil's I, advocate I see for a second, I mean, in the sense that I, I I agree that there should be a debt cancellation, but the purpose of the debt, I mean, forget about the the ec economics of it. Debt plays a political role in that it forces governments to be accountable to, in this case, international bondholders. But of course, who governments should be accountable to is their own citizens. So, exactly. you know, I'm hesitant to say there should be unilateral debt cancellation of all of the debts, because whatever government comes in is going to, they're just going to take new loans and they're not going to be responsive to the situation either. So it's a, it's a deeper question about how can, how can we fix, because uh, this whole debt question and so on has, has, we have the politics being completely skewed. If someone comes in offering a billion dollars for a project, a huge incentive for the politicians to take that money. Um, yep. Not much, in, regardless of what it does for Sri Lanka, regardless of whether it's part of the, the government's development policy or not, regardless of whether it's a good project or not, regardless of whether it's needed. So in that kind of a world, how do we actually ensure some oversight, some accountability, some transparency, so that if you want to take debt, or if, if it, at least it should be debt that is used for the service of the people of Sri Lanka. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, definitely. Because I, I, I don't think uh, any of the governments 
are not willing to take money if the money is available because i th- i think I, I think the debt is something that all the governments are, are, are accessing i mean that's that's part of the this new liberal model so um so i think i think that is where we have to be very careful that if if a, if a country is is managing their debt properly um then definitely we will not go into that this issue i i think i think one of the one of the big message coming from sri lanka you know at at one point uh, one point um, mahathir mohammed said that so we don't want to become another sri lanka because the malaysia was also accepting debt and also especially under the china belt road initiative there were a lot of money available because they had a lot of uh, surplus money but uh, but when we started losing hambantota harbor we should have understand about what this debt can do to a country we didn't learn from that and we continuously started getting this debt so i think the debt a manageable debt is okay for a country but it is not it i mean the many other countries in our part is going through the same kind of process at the moment i think i think if if the countries in the region or or in the world doesn't learn from sri lankan situation i think many of they will will be going through the same process so i think so we have to look at the debt and also this this kind of especially the private bond holders loan from that that perspective because we don't want any of the people in any of these countries suffer because of the the politicians um have access to a lot of money but uh, but because in in all our countries we we our governments are just like five years and after that that debt become the problem of the next regime so uh, so we don't want to think in that way i think the the national debt sustainability is something that every country should should be taking care of so i think the people should be able to push the national governments to be uh, behave well and be vigilant on what is what is um, going to happen with the enormous access to the money available so i think as there are a lot of yeah. learning we can get through this 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 crisis Fantastic. I think that's a great place to to leave it. Uh, Hemanta Vitanage, thanks so much for your time. Thank you very much for the opportunity. We hope you enjoyed this peace vigil presentation. Do remember to like, subscribe and share with your friends. Peace Vigil works on peace education. Until next time, remember that peace needs all of us.